number one thing I've learned in my career mm -hmm. that I think every business and every person struggles with is prioritization. Mm. What matters most right now? I'm so excited for today's episode. Today, we're going to have a discussion with Benson Medcalf, CEO of Skylab Ventures. Warren Buffett raised all our bars about focus when he said, an investor should act as though he had a lifetime decision card with just 20 punches on it. Develop a priority worthy of budget holders and investors' focus. Then ask them to use one of their 20 punches on you. In just a moment, the one, the only, Benson Medcalf. Welcome to Bold Breakthroughs that unstick work and life. I'm Mark Cook, New York Times bestselling innovator. Each week I offer keynotes that engage thousands, and teams embed me weekly to unstick tech pivots, sales prospects, and ops constraints. We roll up our sleeves in small groups to create breakthroughs on top priorities for each individual, in person or via Zoom. Nine global studies of over two million successes have fueled my 4,000 wins at top brands. I've shared rapid innovation in over 50 cities worldwide. Teams create revenue breakthroughs and clients see new profits. Thank you for listening and inspiring your breakthrough today. Benson Medcalf. Benson, it's so great to have you with me today talking about this important topic. I want to get right into this and talk about the two parts of our topic today. First of all, we get stuck at work in a hundred different ways, and it happens to almost everyone in their career. Second of all, we find a way, hopefully, most people find a way to create breakthroughs and get to the success on the other side of that for clients, for themselves, for their families, etc. So I want to dive right in and I want to start at the beginning and ask you if you've ever had an experience where you felt stuck in your career. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that along my career at every stop that I've had, there have been times where I've been stuck. I, I think most of the time it has to do with feeling like my growth has slowed or that opportunities to learn new skills have it's sort of run its course, if you will. I mean, I, I think most of us love the feeling of growth. It can be challenging and painful to grow, but we all want to learn and grow and develop. And so when I feel like those opportunities are starting to slow down, um, I get a little bit on edge about finding that breakthrough that can allow me to keep growing. I had one experience, I remember I was living in Dallas, working for Bain & Company, and had been there for a couple of years, jump, jumping from you know project to project as consultants do, and um, kind of feeling like in that band of time where you're in that certain role, that uh, it just started to feel a little repetitive. And when it's repetitive, that's where I feel stagnant. And so anyway, there was this opportunity that opened up to uh, move our family to Perth, Australia, <laughs> from Dallas, Texas. I mean, it's about the opposite side of the world. Um, but the opportunity was to start the Bain office over there. And so we applied, we were selected as part of the landing team. We went over there to build the office for a year and a half, and it was phenomenal. All of a sudden, I wasn't, I wasn't doing much different in terms of my actual work, but it was in a new environment with a new team. It was entrepreneurial. I was on the front lines trying to build this office, and the feelings of growth just came flooding back, and I learned a ton. It was unforgettable. That's such an unexpected big example. I love that. Uh, I want you to back up a little bit before we get to that successful ending. And I want you to elaborate, if you would, about the time where you started to feel work slow down and how you felt and what you were thinking. I, I sort of have this view that if you're not moving forward, you're sliding back. Like there isn't really any just holding your ground, so to speak. So the feeling that I had was even though I'm and doing good work for my clients, I felt like um, th that if I'm not doing new types of work or really stretching myself, that I was sliding backward. Like that's just kind of how it felt. I felt like if I didn't do something about it, there were colleagues, peers, 
friends, whatever, that we're going to continue to advance and, and I didn't want to be left behind. It's certainly understandable thoughts in that situation. It's interesting how many ways we can get stalled or frozen at work or in our career. You know, back at the back half of 2019, I had this random spine infection get me and it spread throughout my entire body. It even went septic. It almost killed me except for my wife made me go to the hospital finally with 105 temperature and excruciating pain. I couldn't be touched. And she even persuaded me and made me wait at the hospital. I was trying to get them to release me and I wanted to just get home. And uh, she made me wait for that fourth doctor's opinion about what in the world was going on with me. And luckily she did or I wouldn't be here. So that led to me having a lot of time to think about work because I was three months horizontal on a couch and in a bed with an IV directly into my heart. For three straight months, I was horizontal. Uh, it didn't lead to great performance at work. It really made me and forced me out on my own to start my own company with not much choice. Um, but I was thrilled to do it. I'd been planning on it. I'd been looking forward to it. Uh, and, and so we did it. These things take all sorts of shapes. I want you to jump ahead now and, and tell me about any others that you've had in your career where things stalled or slowed down or you felt like you were stuck in a mire. Candidly, we were uh, middle of the pandemic trying to sell our company. Uh, we started out trying to raise money in the middle of the pandemic, which we had the opportunity to successfully take capital, but comparing that to the sale of the business, the sale route was better. But what that ended up meaning for me as the chief operating officer is that I was made redundant. <laughs> the buyer had two COOs, they didn't need a third. Um, <laughs> and so I, I started to see the writing on the wall that in a couple months when this deal closes, um, uh, you know, I'm gonna need to figure something out. Um, that was tough. I mean, it's always hard to lose your job. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how great the exit is. Um, you you have something and then you don't benefits salary protection um and and clarity right so this presented i think a feeling of being stuck and uncertain but to to be honest it also presented some excitement like there's a new chapter to be had and new you know new journey ahead so i mean i looked at a bunch of different things um I thought about acquiring a small business. I mean, I couldn't buy anything much bigger than, you know, a tiny little business. But that I started scrolling um, the <laughs> broker websites here in Utah, just looking at different companies that were on the market. Um, I talked to some mentors and that uh, the amazing thing is one of my mentors matched me up with one of another guy that he mentors. And so it was almost like an arranged marriage and we, we came together. <laughs> realized we had a ton in common with respect to fundraising and venture capital and how we interact with businesses and so long story short we started our own fund uh, it's called Skylab Ventures and we're you know seven or eight months in now and it's awesome it's going great yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so, so good. huge huge uh, appreciation to a mentor who helped me with a breakthrough there but um, I I look back and I'm you know, getting stuck, if you will, in that moment was the, one of the best things that's ever happened to me. It's really clear that one of the things that makes you so successful is that you really do make lemonade out of lemons. You know, whatever work situations present themselves to you, it's clear that you, we can hear it. You make a choice that I am going to learn from this, I'm going to wait and see what windows open on, not wait in the sense of sitting around and hoping something comes to you, but actively looking, where's the window, where's the door that's going to open and present a new path forward. It's really admirable. I appreciate uh, hearing that one as well. You know, another thing that you're pointing out is something that's very common in the workplace. We're going along, we're doing our job, we're working for a few months, and all of a sudden our boss or someone else hires a position that gobbles up about a third of our responsibilities 
and we get nervous and a sense of security is lost. And so it takes a lot of courage and a lot of fortitude to muster the strength to go on, full go, give it your all, earn more than your paycheck, and still accept what you get. And it's a really difficult thing to come to work over a few months, whatever the situation, whether it's an acquisition or department expanding or whatever it is, and find three different people in your same role. So uh, it, it, similar things happen to other people. And, and I'd love to hear what personal conversations happen inside your household. Well, one of the biggest personal challenges was that my wife and I were looking at homes to buy. Well, you're not getting a loan if you don't have an income. <laughs> and if you branch off and start your own business, you, that clock is going to be delayed a couple of years. Uh, so it actually really helps to just have a steady job, nice salary. Uh, so you know, very personally, uh, we realized that any, any thought of a home buy was going to be pushed out. Mm. And that was, t that was tough. It sounds like you handled it very well. Uh, I'm interested in how you went forward at work given what was going on. And I know that one of the most important things that we can do to get unstuck and maybe pivot around an obstacle is to spend a significant amount of time getting within our own mind and in the minds of those people that we would like to serve in the same company, in a different role, or maybe at a different company, or if we start something ourselves, you know, what is it that we want to do? But even more importantly, when we have a sense of even the general area of that, digging into the metrics and the meaning of those people that we want to serve, and are there enough of them? Are they available to us? What were you thinking about your own career in, in, in these regards? Yeah, well, I thought about what, what personally I want to be doing. I wanted to be running a company. Uh, for all of my career, I had been either running big chunks of the company, departments, divisions, or whatever. Um, I had been advising big companies or CEOs, or I had been investing into them. But I had yet to really run and start my own thing. So uh, the, the d internal kind of debate that I was having was, do I start from scratch or do I buy something that's already operational? Mm -hmm. um, with a family and, and needing income and everything, the idea of actually buying something that was already operational actually felt a little more safe hmm. and appealing because there was already something there. Starting from scratch, of course, you, you're gonna have to bootstrap it uh, for some period of time or take on money or whatever that might be. but. It's not as instantaneous. So those were the kinds of thoughts that I was having is what do I want to be and be doing? Uh, I knew I wanted to be leading the company and, and, and then it was just a matter of like in what context. But I'm sensing a turn in the story because I am not talking to you from a company that you're running. I'm talking to you from a venture fund that you are a co-owner of and a partner in. And so something happened. And I would suppose that this is going to be a lesson of how when we try to innovate our career that there's going to be turns and pivots and things even after we make a breakthrough. What happened? You dug into your mind, you dug into the people you wanted to serve, you brought in your network as you should with new experts and new contacts and even a new mentor. Why aren't you running your own company? Why are you running a fund? It's funny because what took me to my mentor was a business that was for sale that I thought I'd like his feedback on. How does he, how does he view this deal, the market, the opportunity, the price? Um, so actually it was a physical product company so I bought a few of them and I sent one to my mentor and I said, hey, give me a call when you get this. And he got it. Um, and he said, you know, we talked about the deal a little bit and he's like, before you move forward, I just, I just want to introduce you to somebody, S sit tight for a second. And so then that introduction to my now partner came. Um, so that, that was, it was a, a pivot for sure because I thought, I, I thought we we're going to, I was going to do this deal. As it turns out, about 
four months later, not only would I had I partnered with my uh, my partner now, but we bought the business that I was looking at. So it kind of came full circle. We ended up putting that business in our portfolio. It's highlighting for me is not only did your mentor provide other contacts, which is really the friend's friend phenomenon that gets you more and exponential ideas that help you with your breakthrough. But this, this very visceral, hands-on investigation of the new business and becoming part of that and helping create it for the long run really enters a, a new phase of you really know the companies that you invest in. And it sets up a model for how you do business with your portfolio. And so rather than just looking and hoping that things work out, this active innovation of your own career really seems to have paid off. Navigating the process of a breakthrough is a team sport. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I had no shame in you know, getting people as advice and talking about it. And uh, when, I, when people, close friends of mine found out that we started Skylab, they're like, wait, I thought you were gonna buy a business. I'm like, well, we're actually gonna buy lots of businesses. <laughs> we're gonna invest in a lot. So it's sort of a meta uh, version of what I had, had in mind. It's a crazy economy. It's a global economy. Things are shifting all the time. There are people all over that wonder what's next. What's next in my company? If, if there's no place for me there, what place do I have in the economy? If people are feeling that derailed or that disenfranchised, what do you say to them? How should they view the world? Is there a chance for them to find a way to get unstuck and really make a personal breakthrough in their own work life? Yes, um, I feel like there's, you have to view the world in a way where you can affect your outcomes. I mean, uh, that, that's just that mindset I think is so important. So I recognize that you will hit a trough where you're kind of stuck or depressed, but that mindset's so important that you can find a way out. Um, as it relates to capital in particular, because that often is a roadblock for folks, um, there are just so many stages of business and so the, the consultant answer is it depends. But, uh, <laughs> but there are different milestones that, um, that are maybe notable um, that, have, uh, that have different scenarios for capital. Mm -hmm. um, if you're part of a very small company, a startup, maybe it's your startup or maybe you're just a team member of something that somebody else founded, you're going to likely lean on friends and family or founder capital for some period of time. And, and generally, that kind of capital is not necessarily really active, directive, uh, and impatient. Generally, that kind of capital is, is pretty friendly. Friendly, you know, family. It's family <laughs> capital, right? And so you have time to build this thing and get it off the ground. Um, but in order to get any more capital, you really have to show some results. And there's this phrase, product market fit. Mm -hmm. And what that really means is that you have um, some solution to an existing problem and that you're finding a way to convince people that that is the right match. Yeah. Let's say for just a minute that you have worked maybe extra hours to find in your company a great new idea that could really benefit the people that you are serving. And the match is great. Whatever the service or the product is that you're thinking about providing, you've tested, experimented a little bit on the side, and you find that it satiates these needs, these underlying psychological desires. It meets practical purposes that they're looking for, and there's some real promise for that. It's safe to say that your executives and your bosses should listen to this. Sometimes they don't. We should put pressure on ourselves as leaders to make sure we're listening to these ideas of our people to make breakthroughs for us and our customers and our stakeholders. But let's say they don't. If someone had an idea like that, is their capital available 
for someone like that out there in the investment land to make that product market match realized out in the market, because if so, I think it's going to put a lot of pressure on leaders to think about this. Think about how hard they listen to their employees and people that work for them. What do you think? In all truth, there has never been a time where there's more money available to be invested. Mm -hmm. There is, and it, it, we call it dry powder, you know, the old ammunition term. But there is a lot of dry powder in the world today. And I can tell you that firsthand because I'm fundraising for my fund and I, I, I'm stunned at how much capital <laughs> is out there. So you have to be a little bold in seeking it out. If you don't have that rich uncle that can just write a check, which I don't, um, you, you gotta you know, talk to people, seek it out, reach out to people on LinkedIn and, and you know, find a mentor that can help open a door. Mm -hmm. um, there's no replacement for selling, like you being your best salesperson. Yeah. Tell me about that. I really believe in that, actually. Yeah. If you find what you call the product market match, if you find which what, what that really means is you really do have a way to help a, an identifiable group of people. Yeah. That marketers will call a target market, and the new ones will call a persona set, and yeah. things like that. But it's just a group of people that yeah. has some homogeneity yeah. that we can identify and get to, whether it's electronically or real driving down the street in your car. If there's enough of them mm -hmm. and you really could help them, then you might have something, right? Right. And so if you do have something going on like that, what is, what is the avenue to find the connections? Like, do you just start asking friends and family, mm. all of them, or what would you suggest? Yeah, so you're specifically referring to the capital provider Yeah, the, mo the money, the capital that they would look for. Yeah, so um, I think finding other business leaders mm. that maybe, maybe they run a company that's a little bigger, maybe they've been through a couple of the hurdles, um, but business leaders, I think, are very willing to help and share knowledge and experience and connections. Mm -hmm. um, so f I think the, the best thing is pick three to five people, leaders of business that you know. Um, and if you don't know them personally, find people who do, who can make that connection for you. And those three to five people could probably make the introduction that you need. Yeah. I think one of the big mistakes people make is they go on a social media, they go to their contacts, forgetting that they don't know hardly any of those people really. Yeah. And then they go find a common connection. And likewise, that person knows virtually none of his or her connections yeah. at all. Yeah. And we think that will connect. And what I found is if, if you go on, for example, LinkedIn and you go down to the, the recommendations or the endorsements, mm -hmm. they know those people. They know those business leaders. They're former yeah. bosses, former CEOs. Yeah. Those are the people they really know. And so those are places to look for those I think that's very people. wise. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So let's say they get going um, and in, in their hope and they start thinking, well, he said there's lots of money. I know I could help them. But there must be some limitation on, on these things. Like I've heard, for example, that service businesses aren't as interesting to someone like mm -hmm. you ever. Or wh what kind of business is, is maybe a bad idea? There's no guarantee. So let's talk about the negative version. Like what are, what are the bad ideas for trying to get money from any source? Well, I, I hate to label it bad just because uh, it depends on what your goals are. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are so many um, great little businesses out there where a founder has um, launched something that, that serves a need. Maybe it's a service, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but it requires a lot of time of that founder to, to scale. I mean, think about a dentist. Um, unless a dentist has enough cl clients that or patients that they can hire another dentist to do the job, mm -hmm. the dentist has to be there in the seat doing the work. And when they're on vacation, that place is closed. Yes. Right? So, and, and dentistry is a great cash flowing um, industry. 
But if you want to be maybe picky about it, it's, it's bad in the sense that it doesn't scale unless you start buying up other practices and hiring dentists to do the job for you. Because if you're not in the seat, it's not, it's not selling and, and working. So I, I think if you want to sort of look at the world in the terms of scaling and like what, what can really grow, where, where you are the reason it moves and you have to be awake and operating to do <laughs> it, uh, you won't get as far as you could if, if you had some sort of leverage in that process where the money is being made while you sleep. Yes, and of course, if you have picked a business or an occupation where you can be part or build a machine that serves people continuously and brings in the transaction for that service continuously, that's wonderful. But what about this dentist? What about someone else? Is there no hope? Isn't it true that they can also find a clever way through rapid innovation or a some other acquisition or some other method of expanding their automation, of creating some renewable product-like subscription or something? Some of the best and biggest companies in the world today started as a services business where mm -hmm. it, it required own you know your own labor to make mm -hmm. it work and over time a transformation was realized and they moved to a software platform from a services foundation so there there definitely is an ability whether you're a dentist or a you know a tradesman or whatever it might be to transform you know the nature of your business so that you can scale yes i do think it's important to point out that creating a vision takes a little more work than what we usually hear about or think about. Creating a vision of scalability, of automation, of a future version of this product, service, or business that can be scalable really takes some serious courage and thinking work. For example, you have to think through all the elements of a scene that might be out a couple of years. You have to be able to paint a picture in people's minds of a reality that's going to take place in the economy, in that market of human beings you're trying to serve that is real and could actually happen. Now, I'm not talking about very specific details like creating a business plan in the future when we're not even engaged in that type of activity yet but it has to be tangible, it has to be seen, it has to be done with a tremendous amount of work and not just casual ideas. Now, I, I think it's important also to ask you this question. We've been talking about making a breakthrough kind of in an isolated, independent way at work or in a business, but we also pivot, we also try to create these breakthroughs as a team and also as a small company or even a mid-sized company with a new direction, with a new intent. Could you talk a little bit about what that looks like and whether you're useful in that regard or not? Yes, um, and we just used the word intention. I wanna bring that word back in here because um, a good business manager, a good leader, a good CEO, whatever, is going to be monitoring cash while the business is performing mm -hmm. such that you don't run dry and then realize you need to raise more money. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why you wouldn't want that situation is you lose all the leverage in the, in the negotiation with a capital provider, whether that's mm -hmm. debt or equity. Um, the desperate negotiator is the weak one. So um, I've been in fundraising processes on both sides and um, if you can plan your fundraise where you still have you know four or five or six months of runway, that's a wonderful place to be because you 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 aren't desperate. Mm -hmm. um, so I would think about you know very practically calculate how much cash you're burning in a given month. If you're still in a like a a loss period, you're not profitable yet, and multiply that by five or six. And that's the sort of your safety net. <laughs> Don't go below that before you start your process to raise some money. If there really is a possibility of turnaround 
or getting to profit at some point, don't let the losses stack up so much that it's clear as, as a funder like you or a boss or an executive team can see that that's going to exhaust whatever we've allocated for that product or whatever capital we have for this business. So go, reach out, connect, have you part of the team earlier rather than later. Capital providers are shrewd, um, practical business people. Mm -hmm. And so they're not gonna overpay for something that is destitute. What about if things are just humming along and they're just kind of flat? How do you look at that? Well, I mean, it's always a little bit um, concerning if a business plateaus, like what is what are the underlying things that are causing that? But perhaps maybe we reframe it and we say um, there, there are some good signs that demonstrate you're figuring something out, like it's working, mm -hmm. but you just don't have enough capital to really accelerate it. Mm -hmm. That is where it gets exciting for both the founder and the capital provider because the dollars that you put to work, it's almost like a, I heard this phrase today that I love. It's almost like a magic ATM, mm -hmm. meaning like you put a dollar in and $10 come out. Mm -hmm. So that's a great situation for an, a founder and investor to come together because, hey, there's something here in this model. Uh, we figured out this problem and this solution go together. And when we sell to this persona, they buy it and love it. Mm -hmm. Well, if we had 10 more dollars to put to work to hire sales per people, and that leads to $100 back, that's, a, that's an easy thing to put money behind. Um, that's a good bet for you. And it's a great bet. Yeah. And then, um, you know, that's increasing the value of the company every single month as more sales are coming in. Um, so that's an exciting place to be. That's, that's sort of like the... Uh, the growth stage, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. um, where there's enough signals that are saying this is working, it's a going concern, and now we need to turn on the jets. But let's go back down just for a minute to a small team or small company. And let's say that some of those gears have traction, the teeth are, are connecting and, and, and turning, and some are about to. They're starting to get on top of things, but they haven't quite reached profitability yet, but they're close. How does that look in your world and how do you relate uh, your thinking in that world? As you get more mature, approaching profitability and really operating more efficiently becomes really important. And there's a trade-off, you know, if you, if, if profitability maximization is your goal, mm -hmm. then it's very possible that growth will be sub-optimized. Mm -hmm. So you have to really understand what is your true objective and maximize or optimize for that. Mm -hmm. uh, because profitability and growth generally are a little bit of a teeter-totter. Right. You're going to spend to grow and that will eat away <laughs> at some profitability. Um, and so along, but what generally what happens for most companies is that you go through a J curve. Mm -hmm. You start spending and it's, you're operating at a loss in order to generate big growth. And then as the company gets bigger, it's harder and harder to, to really show year over year growth at massive step function levels. But so that growth starts to slow, but profitability should start to rise. Yeah. So it kind of has to do with the maturity of the business. Let's talk about you have a little ownership in the company that you work for and those other partners have been in business with you for a while. It could be a significant other. It could be your high school best friend or it could just be a colleague that you've gotten to know through business somehow that you've had a great relationship with for a long time. But things are getting a little sticky emotionally and relationship wise and you're not enjoying yourself or they're not enjoying them themselves or benefiting. Is, is your type of capital a solution for something like that? Sometimes the, sometimes the best use of capital is to just reset. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have a troublesome partner or an investor that's on the board that is not really helpful anymore, sometimes buying them out is really a breakthrough. 
uh, and capital can certainly create that. Um, many, in many cases, capital is used to clean up, if you will, uh, maybe something that has gotten a little bit off track. Um, so that's certainly a possibility. I, I think another um, adjacent version of this, if you will, is founders and executives, they get quite a lot of their own wealth tied up into that mm. one entity. Yeah. And so sometimes outside capital can help them diversify their holdings. So they, sh they sell a piece of their shares mm -hmm. to an another capital provider that brings in somebody else to the business, but it also helps you as the founder to diversify a little bit. So talk a little bit about getting sensitive to the context and the timing and how diversification or a brave investment plays in that role. I mean, the reality is if you think uh, about some of the most successful people in the world from my like wealth generation standpoint, mm -hmm. they almost all have done it through uh, one big bet. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bill Gates, hmm. Steve Jobs, Interesting. all these guys, they made one big bet. Microsoft hit it, Apple hit it, uh, you, Amazon and Jeff Bezos. Like these guys, they made one big, all their eggs were in one <laughs> basket until they were able to get it big enough that somebody was willing to buy a piece mm -hmm. of, their, of their business. Mm -hmm. And that, only then were they really able to diversify. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually some... This may be an, a tangent, but there's some really good things to think about in that regard. Like, should we be diversified as much as we are hmm. with where we're at in our little wealth journey? Hmm. Maybe we should make some bigger bets on the, what we're doing. So we watch for a reverse diversification, a focus of our investment. If it's on ourselves, to bet on ourselves, if we found a way to make some traction, help a, a group of people profitably, then we can often make a greater return than we can find anywhere else. And why not bet on ourselves if it's the right time, if it's the right context? It's really a powerful thing to watch for in our careers. But at a point, you'll, you'll get to a point where I'm ready to diversify and yeah. de-risk a little bit of my situation. We hear out in the workforce that we're not an investment like you. We hear words, we've learned them sometime in MBA school or something things like angel investor, all the different types of investors. But I think it'd be worthwhile to just take a couple of minutes because some people that listen to this will be actually looking for investment firms. And if you could just talk a little bit about the different types and kinds of investment firms, give us a refresher so that we have the up-to-date information, definitions, and we're clear on it. We talked about angels a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Those are mm -hmm. um, generally high net worth individuals or friends, family, folks that you can kind of call on and they're not going to be most likely they're not going to be really active in your business mm -hmm. but they trust you they're supportive of you and they want to cheer you on with a little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of green um, as you move up there's something called seed stage mm -hmm. generally this is for a business that's being nurtured and needs you know it's called seed capital um, there's not really a I would say a specific rule of thumb on it but you're you might be pre-revenue you might be just barely breaking into revenue, um, but they're at a stage where you're you're about to about to take off. Um, venture capital as a um, kind of a category, if you will, um, there's there's quite a bet that's being made in venture capital for the most part. Um, hmm. You're definitely in revenue, but are you going to make it or not? It's, it's kind of a, a a gamble, if you will. Um, in most venture capital funds, I think their success rate's like 20% of their portfolio <laughs> wins. The others are failures. Um, as you get to private equity, generally these companies are gonna be more mature and uh, cash flow positive. We talked about the trade-off of like mm -hmm. growth and profitability, and what most private equity firms want to see is not growth at all costs, but growth at profitability, growth at smart costs. And the reason for that is because the model of private equity is a debt plus equity model. They want to use some debt to place on the business to, uh, in the same way that you would put debt to buy a home. 
um, so they lever up that equity and allow the equity to kind of multiply alongside mm. the debt. Um, mm. But you have to have a mature company to do that so that you don't bankrupt the company. Well, let me ask you this. If you are a business owner or an executive of a small or a large company and you wanted to participate in any of these funds and contribute and therefore earn a return with the investor, are all of these available for you to contribute individual funds to? If, if you're talking about a specific fund, mm -hmm. um, generally these are governed by uh, the, the SEC rules. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be what's called an accredited investor, mm -hmm. uh, which is just a simple checklist really. It's not like you're taking a test or anything to, <laughs> to become an accredited investor, but this means that you have a certain level of income or net worth. I think I think it's 200,000 in annual income or a million dollars in net worth. So it, it, that may be out of reach for some. It may be absolutely within the range for others. But I think you have to think about that in relation to whether or not a fund structure is right for you as an investor. Uh, when it comes to angel investing, that's far less governed and structured. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to invest behind your friend's business, you know, that's a deal that you can make. Be careful though, make sure that you know what you're doing, right? Make sure it's not a single dental office that has no plans for expansion, no plans to create software or automation or scalability of any kind. Okay, well let's make sure that we understand if we do go looking for an investment group that we could have a chance to invest in and follow some of those rules. What should we expect as far as the various types of relationships that we'll bump into and the expectations that we have from these different kinds of funding institutions? Could you just kind of review that for a minute? Well, it, no matter what kind of capital provider you're working with, mm -hmm. they may have certain objectives or traits, if you will, just because of the way they're set up. There are some who are set up to be really patient and they can wait a long time to see their money come back. Um, and so I think about this continuum of patience and impatience. <laughs> um, impatience, on the other hand, is, is a little more urgent, a little more time bound, and maybe they have a two to three year horizon, or maybe it's five to seven. Um, but you wanna know, if you're gonna take money from somebody, what is their time horizon? <laughs> are these guys patient or impatient? I think another category I think about is, are they active or passive or quiet? Um, there's a time and a place for a real active investor. Maybe they have a skill set that you need, maybe they've had experience that you can benefit from or advice, but other times it's actually really nice to have a quiet partner. You know, money's green and you just simply need their money to do what you do and, and um, I mean, I can tell you from the experience we've had fundraising, we have some of both. We have, we have some who are active. They want to they wanna hear updates. They want to see <laughs> progress. They want to be involved in some of the companies. And then we have others who are so unaware of what we're doing that they just say, hey, we trust you guys. Do a great job and yeah. let me know when I'm going to expect a check. You know, <laughs> like that. It's, so there's the whole spectrum. It's fascinating. This brings up a really important opportunity, not just for people that are trying to go out on their own business or get investment for someone like you, but someone who's working right now for another company and they're trying to recommend and internally sell an opportunity for a breakthrough that they could personally lead or with a team. Because this set of criteria that you're talking about, about expectations and involvement, certainly <laughs> involves internal bosses, internal executive teams, and board members and relationships as well, if you think about it. You know, you have to look throughout an organization. You can't always just default to your boss, like I'm gonna get the breakthrough there. You might have to go to a different department. And as you're shopping around mentally inside whatever small or large organization you work for, you do want to just carefully learn a little bit about the patience and the attitude for investment and how things need to go and how quickly they need to go. You also need to ask questions and think about 
how the personality is. Are they someone who is a micromanager or are they totally aloof? And usually, of course, you want a leader that's in between that allows you to run what you're running, but also support you mightily. And that's definitely somewhere in between. And so you don't want to end up actually closing a deal, so to speak, internally with one of the extremes in many cases. Absolutely, yeah. You must deal with a lot of conversations in business where you sense even though they're not saying it explicitly, they're not telling it out loud, but you sense that someone feels disengaged, stuck, stalled, blocked in their work. What do you do there uh, from a distance? Do you get involved? Do you try to lead from where you are in your relationship as a separate entity for one of your portfolio leaders? How does that work and what's your philosophy there? As recent as yesterday, I was sitting down with two founders of a business that we've invested in, mm -hmm. and we were talking about resource allocation, which effectively is synonymous with strategy. You know, what are you really putting your resources towards? Um, and they have been an amazing team together for about four years until we came into the picture and we've invested in them. Um, and they're, they're were, they were feeling stuck. It was evident they were stuck because now they're, they're not used to putting so much cash to work so fast. This is as big as they've ever been. This is more money than their account than they've ever had. Um, and so we sat down and the conversation was basically, hey guys, you need to increase your cash burn by X to why some somewhere in that range and try some things see if like you know what's working but we also want to see if there's a few other levers that we can pull mm. pull them let's go them. let's go yeah so let's see what happens this month by pulling yes. these three yes. levers pull the first three levers of rapid innovation go get deeper much deeper in the mind of your prospective buyers for what you're thinking about then go have bold encounters with how other people are serving them see how they're buying and using anything that's similar so you're there you're in the space of the problem having a visceral experience a three-dimensional experience it's not just about new ideas but actually feeling the emotion and the passion and the purpose of buyers about that. And then finally, going out to new experts, not just within that industry, not just within your team, but people that serve the exact same market, even in just a parallel, an analogous way, because you'll get ideas from a different swimming pool, not the one that you've been swimming in as you've created this business plan or started your business and you've got some traction. And I think what you're saying is, great, we're ready to invest. But at this point, after pulling those three levers, you've got a pile of a hundred or more real potential opportunities for this new path. But you're not willing to invest in that. That would be terrible. That would be a horrible idea. So look through the pile. Find two that have synergy that are worth experiments and make a couple of experiments happen. Yes. New things. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, it was awesome to see these guys uh, grapple with their own frugality, mm -hmm. but also balance that with, hey, there's a serious opportunity here mm -hmm. and it's going to take investment. Wow. This is a critical point you're making. There are really two stages to what we're talking about today. So, you know, you can pivot to get around an obstacle, but once you get out from behind it, then you have the breakthrough where you have to actually charge forward and get much done. And that takes some creative, some rapid innovation to really plan, ideate, execute, and succeed in that running down the new path, which is a very different thing many times than just getting unstuck. So it's a really important point. Tell us a little bit about what you specifically are looking for and what you do here and how we can get a hold of you, etc. We label ourselves as VC, venture capital. 
The reality is we're somewhere between venture and private equity in mm. the way that we're set up. Uh, there's two real big differences with us versus I think everybody else in the market. Mm -hmm. Number one, we came from an operator background. So we've run companies, we've scaled companies, we've sold them. Uh, most venture capitalists have not. They've simply been investors. They're financial engineers. Um, they're super bright, smarter than I am, but they haven't run a business. The second big difference for Skylab is that we are specifically seeking out companies that we think can be bought or so, you know we, that we can grow and sell in two to three years. And that's called, that we call it an exit. Mm -hmm. An exit can take many forms. It could be a bigger competitor swooping in and buying up that, acquiring that business. It could be a private equity buyer that says, hey, this is an awesome asset. I want to have this in my portfolio. And so we want to buy the controlling position in that company. Mm -hmm. Or it could be other investors that want to take our position in the cap table. So there's a lot of flavors of it. But what I have found and my partner has found is that most VCs don't openly talk about the exit that we want to go create. Mm -hmm. Unless it's an IPO in 10 years, you know, like that's the typical route that these VC companies will go to. Hmm. For us, that takes too long. We're, yeah. too, we're too impatient. Yeah. So if we were to categorize ourselves, we're a little bit more on the impatient side because we want to we want to help you grow for two to three years as fast as we can. And then we want to sell this company because there are only so many windows that you have to, mm. to harvest your company. Hmm. Uh, sometimes that window closes and you think that there's another one coming and, and maybe it doesn't come. So you got to be thinking about the windows of, of opportunity for you to sell your company. Hmm. Um, so those two things, operator background and we are exit minded. It's kind of like flipping homes, hmm. you know, if you will, uh, where there's a little bit of an algorithm and a process and we can help, you know, remodel the home a little bit if it needs it we can you know help accelerate the growth and then together we sell that thing if you've just built a metaphorical home and you love it and you intend to stay in the neighborhood in that particular home for the next 40 years you're not really a candidate to work with skylab ventures however if you build a gorgeous home that you love and you get really excited about selling it in a couple of years and repeating the process and building one you like even more and doing the same in a serial fashion, then you're a perfect candidate for Skylab Ventures. Perfect, perfect. Okay, couple more questions. The first one is, what single piece of advice would you give to someone for getting unstuck? And then, once they do, what would you say about creating a breakthrough? I think the number one thing I've learned in my career mm -hmm. that I think every business and every person struggles with is prioritization. Mm. What matters most right now? If, and people don't spend enough time thinking about what matters most. So anytime you're stuck, just sort of like clear the table. <laughs> And think about what matters most for that, for that business or your team or whatever the context is. Because generally speaking, if you put more of your time, energy, and money behind what matters most, you will break through. Because what matters most is it, it, everything else can go away. Mm -hmm. And so it's different for you in every context, but um, I just think that's so fundamental. So once you find your focus, then what do you do? Because that's not going to take you forward. To create the breakthrough, what do you say? Uh, you gotta have conviction. Mm -hmm. You know, um, decisions are, are often going to have some type of um, risk to them mm -hmm. that maybe you weren't right. But I think that having conviction in your decision is gonna allow you to move fast and <laughs> learn quickly whether you need to continue to pivot or not. Mm -hmm. So I think speed in decision making is more important than the quality of the decision. <laughs> I mean, if I had, if you forced me to choose, that's the one. I would probably lean towards speed than quality, because you could spend your whole life trying to maximize quality, and then you never make a decision. <laughs> versus s deciding with the data you have 
with conviction moving forward and then hey let's be eyes wide open and learn from it and if we need to pivot you know we can improve quality along the way yeah i think that's maybe one of the most important things that you've said in our conversation is that we have problems that arise and there's really no such thing as a mistake or a failure that everything as long as we're planning on bursting forward and doing better then everything's just a lesson and we have to view work and the things that happen at work in that way so i'm so grateful let me just represent those that watch this and listen that we appreciate your time so much thanks, thanks martin yeah. appreciate it i hope you enjoyed benson medcalf as much as i did i'm so grateful to benson for his insights on focus and financing mother Teresa said together we can do great things the greatest good is what we do for one another I want to thank Benson Medcalf again for sharing his very personal experiences of becoming stuck in work and life and how together he and his wife created a bold breakthrough to help even more people across oceans than his parents' childhood city. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you enjoyed it, please share this episode with a friend that needs a breakthrough. Post this on social media and add my website or tag my YouTube page. Or just text markspencercook.com to a friend or message that link on Instagram right now. Also, make sure to subscribe on my site at markspencercook.com to stay up to date on all the latest advice on how to unstick priorities to create breakthroughs. I'm so grateful that you listened today. And remember, you have people rooting for you. They love you and want you to make your breakthrough. That includes us too. Take the first step. Now, you know what time it is. It's time to go create a breakthrough for your work in life. And we'll see you there.